Thanks all for being here, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to come and speak uh, on behalf of the Re Regeneron Genetics Center. Uh, I am just coming off like a six-year stint in academia, uh, and now I'm in big pharma. Uh, so sorry if you wanted to hear a lot about the history of drug development in the drug development session, because I'm going to talk about at-scale genomics uh, and how that drives at-speed at discovery, which is something I've been doing for a long time. Uh, and my perspective coming from academia recently uh, is that genomics is this big, complex field where you have th these populations of individuals over on the left, and then there's all of this churn uh, and research and really smart people doing all of this work that we call genomics, from the, the logistics of sample collection to the legality of consent, the actual technology of sequencing, which is just some really beautiful and elegant, uh, clever type of wet lab stuff that I understand nothing about. Uh, and then the R&D analysis, the quality control, which is sending a lot of emails to people asking questions, all the way through to replication and validation, which is uh, a big collaborative effort. We do all of this work in genomics. And for me, for a long time, the feeling was that it results in a paper. You do all of this work, you find this really nice result, you associate a mutation with the disease, and you do all these things, and then you have a paper. And you've done this big N of, one, or N of many analysis uh, to get to this finding, and then there's this open question of, how do you bring this back to an N of one analysis? How do you bring this back to precision health? How do we improve an individual's health? And you know, just stopping at a publication never really seemed like it got all the way. Now, as many people in here, I'm sure, are experts in and know, a lot of this work can drive things like decision support. Uh, we think about how we diagnose individuals based on their uh, genetics and how that affects the diagnosis. We look at things like genetic risk and polygenic risk scores, uh, the treatment planning, how can we uh, improve behavior, or make uh, physicians' decisions better, and that can inform a patient's health uh, and how they behave. But what we really want are drugs. We really want to be able to use all of this knowledge and all of these findings to directly improve an individual's health in a way that we can with pharmaceuticals. And why is this? It's not just because we all love drugs. It is because we cannot do drug discovery um, without incorporating human genetics. We're, we just need to have more focus that the human genetics brings, and we need to expand our understanding of how you know, different pharmaceuticals interact with the human biology and that we can use to improve human health. So the, the, there's a couple of points here about you know, the pharma industry in general, which again, many, many people here maybe understand better than I do. The one I wanna draw your attention to is this idea of that most of these drugs are targeting just a handful of genes. One of the scariest things, and scary in that exciting sense, is that there's, when we talk about human genetics and we think about the human genome, there's so much we don't know how to interpret. There's so much we don't understand. And, you know, we have to make sure that we're not just looking under the lamppost or whatever the saying is, the, the hanging light on a street, the street light. We're not just looking under the street light to try to figure out ways to take human genetics and improve human health. We really have to push ourselves uh, as hard and fast as we can to understand more so we can drive this back to the patient. So uh, at Regeneron, uh, again, this is a company I just joined recently and you know, very happy at the Regeneron Genetic Center, who has put together uh, a collaboration or a set of collaborations, over 70 collaborators, representing over a million and a half samples, and that's an older number. And the idea is that we are going to sequence individuals as fast and as efficiently as possible in order to drive this type of discovery. Okay, and it's not just about numbers. For a long time in academia, there was this argument over, do you sequence a lot of people or do you sequence the right people? Are we sequencing the right people? You can do both, right? You can sequence a lot of people and you can have different types of experiments, general population experiments, you know, leveraging pedigree information and family-based studies, uh, really focusing on specific diseases or uh, phenotype uh, cohorts. You can have this type of diversity in your study and do a lot of samples, okay? So this type of collaborative environment, I think others uh, in this session, uh, in these great talks we've been hearing, have touched on this idea that it's more than just what you build internally, it's what, how you partner and the network that you build. This is the only way you can actually leverage all of the, the resources you need in order to go after this many samples and to really drive uh, sort of the rich diversity that we need to examine to get to uh, the precision health, ba ba precision health based on human genetics. 
So, how do we actually accomplish this, accomplish this at the RGC? Uh, we have a high throughput, uh, you know, in, in the sense that sort of puts high throughput to shame, mechanism for sequencing uh, what works out to be about half a million exome samples a year, okay? Uh, that's half a million operations that have to happen a year on a sequencer. Uh, and that goes from our biobank to our library prep to our fleet of sequencers that actually can crank these things out. These things are running 24-7 and we have to support that. And this is the source of our big data, okay? Big data conference, precision health, that's why we're here. But I think there's something a bit different about these big data than maybe other types of big data. Generally, a lot of the things that we hear about in big data, we are sort of, I don't want to say it's a passive collection of data, but we're going out and we're aggregating existing data, you know, metrics from your wearables or, you know, usage patterns or EMR. The data are generated by other processes and we're trying to synthesize those into some sort of new and actionable result. This is different. Right? We are going out and actively creating a ton of data, right? a ton of very expensive relative to other things, very expensive data. So it would be natural to think that this gener data generation step where we have to decide we want to collect data and then we have to go and do it, it would be natural to think that this would be a bottleneck, but it's not. Okay, um, like most big data operations, the data are out there and you have to synthesize those as fast as you can or as fast as you want. But even with this difference of these data having to be generated, it's not the bottleneck, it's the driver. And that is specifically because of the automation uh, and the quality of the process that's been built. Okay, so in that sense, we very are much in a from an analyst perspective, a big data regime where the, the data are the driver. We have more data than sort of the capacity we can analyze with sort of um, historically, and we have to make sure that we're building our infrastructure and our processes in order to analyze these uh, data at the rate at which they're being generated. So now this is the slide um, that is why they didn't let me write the lyrics to rent, because this is how I think about one year. Um, in terms of, I have half a million samples, it's this beautiful thing, we're, we're pushing data out so fast, and these are all the problems that I encounter because of that. Uh, I shouldn't say problems. I said it before in a different talk, I said problems, and then I had consumers, and they're like, do you not like us? Do you not like your collaborators? We love our collaborators, but we have 70 collaborators or cohorts that we're dealing with at, at any given time. What that works out for me is I have to put out a freeze of data every week, and every freeze needs a little bit of hand-holding, not because the process isn't automated, but every cohort's different. And we're going to make sure that, you know, we give this sort of bespoke uh, attention to it. Uh, and the challenge there is to make sure that we're, we're serving all of these consumers and our customers and our collaborators uh, appropriately. We also have this half a million samples a year. What does that mean for me? I'm running 10,000 uh, jobs on the cloud a day, so things are going to fail a lot. I have to deal with those types of things. This is the big data that I think about. It's not necessarily the AI, how do I, you know, do a clever uh, analysis to draw draw signal from the noise, it's how do I keep a process running as fast as I possibly can. Uh, and then also we're generating a lot of new data. I'm estimating on the low end about a, a single novel variant a minute. Uh, and I'm sure there are people in this room we could argue with that ad nauseum, but I'm pretty sure it's at least one novel variant a minute. And thinking about how to get those uh, results uh, out to people who can interpret those and turn them into something actionable is a big challenge. So. Uh, the rest of my slides I'm going to run through at speed are how we do these different things at speed. We've built at speed infrastructure. The idea here is that we need something scalable and elastic, which is why we use a lot of cloud uh, partners, DNA Nexus uh, and Databricks especially, uh, allow us to sort of have this very robust mechanism for generating these data. Uh, in a scalable and, like I said, elastic way, and also to leverage the sort of latest technologies. I'll sort of get why having those latest technologies are key towards the end, but we have very little local compute. We do this all in a decentralized uh, manner, and I think it's really because we need to be able to scale. Um, Variant queries. I mentioned that we're probably generating a, a, new, a new novel variant every minute, or at least, you know, at, at certain points we are. 
what I need to be able to do uh, in my group is to be able to enable uh, the analysts downstream to rapidly query this, this huge data set. You know, we, we've probably sequenced over half a million samples. We have all these variants sitting in a data set. We need to be able to scale the ability to analyze those. And, you know, we've done that with these uh, mechanisms using distributed compute. Again, uh, Databricks is a, is a great partner. But one of the things here is that we're not buying things off the shelf because there's not a lot of customers. There's not a lot of people out there who need the ability to look at over half a million samples worth the variance at a given time. So we're sort of a special snowflake, and we have to then work with our partners to build the tools to do the things that we need to do. And we're really pushing along this way to build those tools in a way that we can make them open source so that as other groups, as our collaborators and other people in the field come up, they can sort of, let, they can sort of take advantage of our experience. Um, you know, and this is probably a very genomics nerdy slide. Uh, I apologize for putting it in here, but I'm a genomics nerd. Uh, we have uh, about two and a half or two, 250,000 samples. We had to aggregate all of those variants. It's 2.7 trillion genotypes. The existing off-the-shelf methods weren't going to cut it, so we had to collaborate um, with our partners uh, to come up with a new computational method. This is just like we heard before. Sometimes you build and sometimes you partner, but a lot of times it's both. You build new things with their, your partners, and this is the only way we'd be able to do this, is to, is to innovate like this. Uh, what does that mean? Our at-speed discovery, we can take th uh, three and a half terabytes of data, it's 1.2 trillion genotypes, and in their raw form, and in a week, turn that into to the analysis that identifies, uh, you know, about 100 loss of function variants per individual, okay? Uh, I just, in the green room, we were talking about how certain uh, data processing were, were choking on about five terabytes, and, you know, we're equipped to handle that. We're just eating that up and spitting it back out into data that can be used uh, to synthesize, you know, new results. So I think the conclusion here is why do we want to go fast? One, the patients can't wait. We got to get these results out to them, and I don't want the analysis to be the bottleneck because the sequencing is not. There's no intrinsic bottlenecks to anything that we do. All we have to do is put the infrastructure together. The last thing I'll say very quickly is that there's such a rapid tech dev cycle that you can't spend too much time figuring out how to do things because by the time you figure out the best way, there's a new thing that's come along. This is the functionally equivalent pipeline which I've worked on uh, before, and uh, it's a really great way that we use to put together uh, with the NIH over 200,000 whole genome samples. But as we start looking at exome sequencing on new sequencing platforms, it might not be the right fit. If you spend too long doing any one thing, it's going to be old by the time you're done. So with that, I can't put up a bunch of acknowledgements, but I do want to put up some public resources that are key for genomics. These are great public efforts that I really encourage people to look into if you're thinking about doing anything at scale or at speed. Thanks a lot.